Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Pro channel and the new year 2024. We all had a good New Year's celebration. Mine was was pretty sedate. <laughs> Listen to all the people shooting off their fireworks in town, which they probably aren't supposed to do. <laughs> but anyway, it was a good New Year's and I hope you had a good one as well. I'm going to start out this new year by returning to my roots, that is Steampunk. This review concerns yet another steampunk YA, young adult, series by a fellow I've been following for some time now. He bills himself as the leading Hispanic voice in science fiction, and he's a bit of a controversial character. His name is John De La Rose, and the series is called The Adventures of the Baron Von Monocle. <laughs> As the name implies, the Baron Von Monocle is a steampunk adventure series starring, of course, youthful protagonists and in various exciting scenarios, and it's currently on its sixth book. But first, a little bit about the author. John De La Rose is Mexican-American, and he lives in California. I assume it's Northern California. And he is unlike a lot of the, you know, more activist uh, Latino types in that he is conservative and openly Christian. He has written several novels and comics, mostly self-published. He was a leading figure in a movement that we call Comics Gate. And if you haven't heard of this, I'll give a brief explanation. There was previously one called Gamergate, in which the gaming community, which is mostly young and male, was very disgusted with the gaming press and some of the companies because they were trying to make the content woke. And they were promoting creators simply because, well, there's a particular creator who was female who wrote what most people believe were terrible games but they had to promote them because she was a woman. Now, of course, the media portrayed this as sexist. We don't want women in gaming. No, that wasn't it. It was, the idea was that she had been given unfair, unfair um, advantage because of her sex. And for whatever reason, I'm not a gamer, so I can't really comment on that. But I am a comics fan. And a couple years later, it happened in the comics world. There were all these really woke storylines, particularly in Marvel, after Marvel got bought by Disney. Disney was only concerned about the properties as being used for movies, so they didn't care about the actual comic books. And a crew of very, very woke leftists took over and started to make it all very social justice type themes. You know, they would change the race of the characters or they would make the characters um, make you know, formerly white heroes make them villains and so on. And that made a lot of people angry. And again, you know, it's because you're racist. <laughs> no, it's because we want storylines that aren't woke. So a lot of people started saying, we're going to make our own comics. We're going to self-publish them and heck with you. Well, how can you quibble with this? Nonetheless, they did. And there were cases where people tried to stop comics get people from being published. I, that's a thing. I actually did a video on this years ago, and this was one of the few times I got down votes back when you could still see them, because I imagine I kind of ruffled a few feathers here. So John De La Rose was one of these people, and he created some of his own comics. And contrary to the racism's charge, yes, there were there were not just white creators, but there were Latino creators such as De La Rose, uh, black one, black creators uh, such as Eric July and uh, Asian as well. <laughs> so, but, you know, of course, the, um, you know, the woke people don't care. If you've got the wrong politics, you don't count. So De La Rose has been very active in social media, and he's become a bit of a troll. Well, I think he's been that way from day one. I think he just enjoys ruffling feathers, as, as I put it. I guess he's a little bit too um, blatant and outspoken. And I did actually write an article for John's blog, it was several years ago, and I think it was something along the lines of steampunk is not dead. And he appreciated that because he was into steampunk himself. So 
Finally, I'm going to get to the story. The Baron von Monocle series is a fantasy steampunk series, which it happens in a world that's much like our own, but different. And it's not like the same land masses. That's the major difference. And there are like bizarre creatures here and there, but it's, you know, it's still essentially much like the Earth. The central characters come from a place called the Kingdom of Islandia. And this uh, shares a peninsula with the Wyranth Empire, which is actively trying to conquer it. So they're currently at war. The main character is a teenager named Zyra von Monocle, who, who is also known as the Baron. Now, I'm not sure why he uses the male title and not calling her Baroness. Because, you know, he's not, uh, he's obviously not a feminist in any way. Maybe it's ironic. I don't know. In some cases, the characters call her Baroness because of her youth. So she inherited this title from her father, who was on this, you know, overseas spy mission. And he disappeared, so people are assuming he's dead. Because of his, her father's presumed death, she inherits the world's only airship. He had, uh, you know, worked with some different inventors and they created this thing that, that he had used to explore many parts of the world which were were unknown and unexplored which is kind of a fun thing about this scenario because in a way it's like the victorian era in their technology and their culture on the other hand it's a lot like the 1500s when much of the world was unexplored as far as the europeans were concerned and the Victorians really wanted that back. I mean, you, you know from their fiction that they really wished there were other places to explore. You know, so that's why they have uh, stories about going inside the Earth and uh, exploring through the oceans and finding underwater cities down there. You know, Antarctica, flying to the moon, all these things. So it kind of, it, it kind of uh, satisfies that aspect of steampunk. So anyway... Zara is of noble birth, as, as I said, although she's been living on her own uh, with her, on her parents' farm. Her mother's died. Somehow she's managing it. And when their town, when her town gets uh, invaded and destroyed by the Wyranth troops, she heads to the capital, uh, Rislandia City, to offer her services to the king, the, the very popular King Malachi. She also has a uh, accompanying her a close friend called James Gentry. He's a childhood friend. He is not in any way aristocratic, but he's a good guy. And they were always tight as kids. And everybody said, yeah, they're going to get married someday. <laughs> but it doesn't quite work out that way. So Zyra has offered the service of her airship. So the king is, you know, helping her uh, create a crew. They're going to go out and see if they can fight the Wyranth. And James, on the other hand, he joins the Knights. He becomes a, a, an apprentice, uh, or a trainee, the, the Steam Knights, they call them. They're these elite warriors that help to defend the kingdom. So it's, part, it's mostly her story, but it's partially his story, too. There are six short books in this series. The first one, For Steam and Country, was 2017. And then the Blood of Giants, 2018, Fight for Rizan, Rizan, <laughs> the Fight for Rislandia, 2018, the Iron Wedding, 2019, the Steam Knight, and finally the Crystal Conspiracy, which came out last year, 2023. And these are rather short, and they all kind of blend together in the series. So I'm going to talk about them in the aggregate. The only outlier is the Steam Knight, uh, which is basically James's story. So it goes with a narrative timeline that kind of matches the first four books, which are all Zyra's story. And in the, the last book takes place after all of those five. A little bit about the context, about the setting. The economy is steam powered, but there's not a lot of detail about that. It's a kind of, kind of a required thing to be a steampunk. As in many steampunks, there's also an alchemical aspect. In this case, it's crystals. There are certain crystals with magical properties that can be used to power things. And in this case, it also powers the airship Liliana, which is Zyra's airship, and allows it to fly. And so it's not actually your 
your standard lighter than air ship, as far as I understand it. There are a lot of whimsical aspects to this series. The first is the first book's title. It's this motto that they say when they're you know, ready to enter battle for steam and country. It's funny. It's it's uh, sounds cool, but it, it's really silly when you think about it to pledge yourself to a power generation source <laughs> rather than God and country or king and country. But, you know, as I said, it's whimsical. Another thing that I, I think was fun and a little silly was the surnames. A lot of these people have odd surnames with uh, steampunk uh, aspects. For example, Von Monocle. And there's a Du Clockhand and a Du Gearsmith and a Von Lantern. So you think, oh, they must have changed their surnames when the Industrial Revolution started <laughs> to celebrate the new technologies. A third uh, that's kind of whimsical is the notion of a teenage girl given command of a military airship. <laughs> but this is typical of YA because... You're supposed to show young people doing unusual and great and heroic things. At least a good YA, anyway. <laughs> Not the, like, I'm so depressed type YA. <laughs> this is the uplifting type. So one interesting aspect, as I said, was that much of this world is unexplored. And in the second book, they go exploring across the Gold Marsh Ocean. There's a lot of interesting geographical names here. To the Zenway continent where there are all these legendary monsters and so on, and, and odd people, including the Nightmen, who are, are blue-skinned and very hostile. And I think that's racist against blue-skinned people. <laughs> uh, just kidding. I love it how you can have you know this imaginary uh, race, and you don't have to worry about offending anyone. The, it's also another thing that's um, big in this book, is mythical races such as the Giants. And they are supposedly the predecessors of the Nightmen. They devolved, as in Lord of the Rings, with some of the elves devolved into orcs. Well, in this case, they devolved into these Nightmen. But also, some of them went underground, went into hibernation, and turned into these giant amorphic blobs. I know it's a little weird, but different, which is why I like it. And they have psychic powers. So you might have this uh, giant living under a mountain who has these abilities to influence humans that come nearby. And it does get into the, you know, go into the plot and the storyline. So the story begins with Zara and James traveling to the capital where they meet King Malachi and volunteer to help fight against the Wyrath. Now Zara has an airship and James enters training as a knight. Now, it's interesting because Zara's always mourning her father, and he does come back later. It turns out that one of, in one of the stories, she has to rescue him from the Wyranth. So very heroic. Originally, there is some romantic tension between Zara and James. And they have this, also, they have kind of this brother-sister relationship, though, at the same time. And in the progress of the story, Zara meets this dashing young white knight named Ethan Von Lantern. And James happens to meet the princess. <laughs> yes, the princess is Raina, daughter of King Malachi. And she takes a real shine to him. And the king's not happy about that because he's a commoner. He says, I like you, James, but I'm seriously, you know, marry a commoner? Can't happen. <laughs> the wild card in the story is a character called Ivan. He is the Iron Emperor, ruler of the Wyrath. Now, as it happens in a lot of YAs, he is pretty young. He's pretty young, and he's single, and he is romantically interested in Zara. Because <laughs> she's famous, he's heard of her, he's tangled with her airship, his troops have. And so he's got this, uh, he's got this kind of Kylo Ren-like obsession with her. <laughs> and he meets with her surreptitiously in, at one point, and you think, why would the Emperor do this? Well, he assures her that his guards are nearby, and if she tries to turn him in, she'll be killed. But he does say that he wants to negotiate to make some kind of deal. In the, and I believe it's the first or second book where he says, I regret what I've done with my troops because he had created this drug that, that's supposed to give them more stamina, but it turns them into crazed killers. And the drug is created from the blood of these underground blob giants. But they are very rare and 
he's thinking that if they go across the ocean to the Zenway continent, they can find some other creature that has this blood that can help them find an antidote. And so it's like, this is in the interest of both of our peoples. Will you do this for me? And because she's a good person and she's kind of trusting, <laughs> she does. And so it's kind of interesting as the books progress and, and all the adventures happen, uh, Ivan becomes more of a nuanced character. At first, he's just a villain. He's just this conquering dictator. And then it turns out that he does have some concern for people. He says, well, I'm basically you know, trying to keep my people keep my people alive. We have these problems, these economic problems, and we need to annex land. And at one point, he actually tells Zara, I have a proposition for you. I want to marry you, and if I and if you agree to marry me, I will give your country this important technology that they need. And essentially, the, the airship at one point crashed and was damaged, but the original inventor, I guess, is gone of the airship, so they can't figure out how to get working again. Well, Ivan says he has the technology, and he will give that to them if she marries him and becomes his queen. And in that case, uh, this will help Brislandia to survive and, ke and keep their advantage. Well, this is an interesting case where we have this theme of self-sacrifice. Because by this point, Zyra is in love with Ethan von Lantern, and he's in love with her. And it's very chaste. There's not, you know, you know, there's not much beyond snogging, as they would call it, <laughs> in in uh, Harry Potter. It's very chaste. But uh, she does love him, and they're thinking about getting married, or at least they're both thinking about it separately and don't really speak about it. And she at this point, she decides, well, you know, I love Ethan, but I love my country more. <laughs> and I want my people to survive. And therefore, I will agree to marry the emperor, you know, as long as we can ensure that this is real. And if I become his queen, I can help to influence him and end the war. And so <laughs> it's it's interesting because there's this there's this kind of weird um, melodrama dynamic going on. And it's, you know, it's like, the villain says, marry me. <laughs> back in the idea, back in a time when anything, any kind of assault or uh, thing like that would have been unthinkable. It kind of takes you back to that, you know. So Ivan, Ivan uh, progresses as a character. He shows he has a good side. He has some good qualities. He does try to make Zara happy. And it gets to the point where they're supposed to get married. But, of course, something interrupts it. And further adventures ensue. And by the time book six, you get through book six, you realize that it's not resolved. This still has to be resolved, so there's going to be more books, which is all well and good. <laughs> they're fun, and they are are engaging. And I think they're very good uh, books for teenagers, especially whose parents don't want them having a lot of, uh, you know, <laughs> woke and, and uh, really sexual content. And there's violence, but it's not... You know, it's not gore or anything like that. It's it's all very up aboard, uh, very above board, very, you know, respectable and heroic. So I think it's a good series uh, for teenagers, especially for younger teenagers. So that's one of the pros. And another pro is that it is adventure, which is fun. There's some pretty interesting world building with bizarre creatures and exotic lands. The characters do grow, and the dialogue is, is interesting and fun. You have a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, teenagers, you know, kidding each other, and people, and people, you know, having spats and so on. And so I think that reads pretty well to me. And like I said, there's nothing weird or woke about it. Cons, yeah, there are, there are cons. First of all, there's not enough gadgets. And I would like to know a little bit more about the technology, especially the airship. Uh, I mean, he focuses more on the adventure and the people, which is fine, but steampunk is also kind of a gearhead thing. And also, there's this stylistic issue, and this is the one that I unfortunately have to ding some off of his series for. The characters have too much introspection. Now, being teenagers, uh, Zara and James, it's understandable that they would have moments of self-doubt. Am I doing the right thing? You know, 
what should I do? Why do people not like me? <laughs> that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I really think I have to do the right thing, and, and I don't want to marry the Iron Emperor, but, wow, I, I, I really think that, that I owe my country this. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Well, a lot of this is redundant because the story shows it. And so some is good, some is necessary, but there's just too much. And as much as I like this series, it's one of my pet peeves. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to give it four out of five gears, five gears being perfect, because I just wish that there was less of this and more like more description, more sensory detail, uh, more metaphors and so on. This has been my review of The Adventures of the Baron Bond Monocle series by John De La Rose, the self-styled leading Hispanic voice in science fiction. <laughs> Please let me know what you think about this in the comments below. Please like and subscribe so we can continue to get out the good steampunk sci-fi word. Please also check out my works on Amazon. As always, I will put my links to my Amazon works in the description. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. And Happy New Year!